guys join us for that if you're available. Yes, we would love to join you for that. Great. Hi, Brad. Welcome. Um, any other questions or comments for Sydney? Okay, well, thanks for coming and please stay as long as you care to. All right, uh, next on the agenda is the John Chavis Memorial Park track naming request. We heard some of that uh, last month um, and I believe Oscar has an update for us. I am not sure if I have an update. I do know that Giovanna has shared uh, some additional uh, uh, input uh, with the board. Um, but other than that, uh, aside from this meeting, I think we have uh, next meeting, which will also be an opportunity for uh, additional public comment. And then after that, uh, I believe September would be the meeting that you all would go ahead and take action. Right. Okay. So, so if you guys saw with some of the materials and, and emails, there were two people, I believe, that were in opposition to the naming. And when that happens, that essentially means that the board um, can choose to take a two additional months to de decide on uh, whether or not the naming request should move forward in order to give people time to kind of um, come forward and speak against or for. Uh, the naming request. So that's that's why we've extended that timeline a little bit. And um, with the materials that Oscar mentioned that were sent out where I believe that the email and opposition um, and the support uh, letters and emails as well. And I believe at this time, we um, there might be someone who would want to come forward and speak and this would be the time that you could do that to this naming request if you want to speak yeah, any, against any, or more. Oh, sorry. Anyone that's Oscar. joined um, online that uh, joined with their telephone, I see there's three people that joined with the telephone to unmute yourself or to raise your hand, you'll need to uh, click star six on your phone. And I'll notice that you'll um, want to speak. No one's done it yet. We'll give another second here. I saw that Otis Davis, and I saw his hand was up. Mr. Mr. Allen, he's uh, on here as a panelist. Here we go. We, okay, Mr. Allen, go ahead. You gotta mute yourself and speak. You're still muted if you're trying to speak right now. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Mr. Allen. There should be a uh, unmute button on your their smartphone or your laptop that you're working off of. You click that, then you should Looks be like able to speak. I think He's unmuted now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, good, very good. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak today uh, in response to the John Chavis, uh, <clears throat> the renaming. Uh, just for the record here, uh, since the last meeting, I've done quite a bit of uh, uh, going into the neighborhoods, uh, talking to people, going out and talking to people. And I noticed you just said there was about two people who was in opposition to the renaming. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't found one of those people yet. Uh, there may be more than two, but I just haven't made, made any contact. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm sitting here now with a friend of mine, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Coleman Blake, and uh, he can speak on behalf of the, uh, the enthusiastic in being a part of Chavis Park. Uh, could he speak now? Uh, sure, yes. That would that okay. Fine. Thank you. He's on his. He's on his computer. Yeah. Hey there. This is Coleman. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think that this would be a very good idea, and I hope that the the board will uh, vote to adopt it. Uh, Pat White sounds like an extraordinary athlete, and he trained on that track, and I think uh, he deserves to have it named. 
Giovanna, were you able to catch both of their full names or do you need that repeated? Oh, I'm Coleman Blake, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. Last name is Blake, B-L-A-K-E. Great, thank yeah. you. I think I may be on as Otis because I was getting ready to pass him my computer if we couldn't get his logged in. <laughs> We had a problem the last time, so we were on top yeah. of it this time. <laughs> we doubled up. <laughs> but well uh, I, I realize we don't have a we have a minimum amount of time. But uh, again, uh, this 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 is really I see. I, I repeat again, it's a very serious situation because it uh, restores a lot of history into the Chavis Park area, the uh, the whole community, that particular area there. And I think this will be a plus. Uh, taking into consideration that we now have a new center, I think this would just be something that would uh, greater enhance it. So that's it. Great. Thank you very much to both of you for your comments. Does Looks anyone... like we have one other person um, as an attendee. I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute yourself. I see your email as uh, flanet, E-W-M-S at bellstaff.net. Oh, that's Miss Lynette. Lynette. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> there are two people. Uh, who were on the phone to watch trying to get in to speak in opposition, and I don't know what happened that they weren't able to connect. But unfortunately, unlike Otis, uh, I've heard <clears throat> multiple uh, comments in opposition to the renaming of the track. Pat White was my high school classmate. I'm in the class of 64. And after the last meeting, after I heard it, it was my first time hearing it. And I would have thought that as much <clears throat> as I have been involved with Chavis and my groom, Bob Mirror Brooks, we're both class members of 1964, we hadn't heard anything about it. So I sent out an email to our class. I have a directory from our 50th year reunion, and not a person knew anything about it, which was a concern for us that our classmate, <clears throat> we would not have been contacted to get support for, for that. So it was, un, it was something that was unfamiliar to us. And so people were writing me back and I said, no, don't write me. And I gave them Giovanni's contact information to share their ideas, <clears throat> their opinions with her because I didn't want to be the person in the middle of yay or nay. But I know that there are at least three people <clears throat> that called me just before you open up that were waiting to speak in opposition to it. The basic concern that the people were saying to me was that that tends to divide the community, that they wanted to keep the wholeness of John Chavis Park intact and did not want to try to identify any one person over the many outstanding athletes and students that we had at Ligon School. And that because of our history of black people being segregated, they didn't want us to segregate ourselves from each other. Those are the comments that I heard. So I don't know if they, they're on the phone trying to get in, they don't have a laptop, but that's essentially the comments that I heard. I heard one positive comment uh, and that was from Dwight Peoples. And I know he sent that by email, but the rest of it from our class of the 60 some emails that I sent out, those that I got back, it wasn't 60, but it was quite a few that had some reservations about uh, using Pat's name on the track rather than continuing to use it, John Chavis. So that was my only comment. For your comments. Is there anyone else at this time that has additional comments? Any other folks on the line that can get through? What was that again, Michael? If they are on a phone, what did they press? Star? It was star six. six. Star six. It does not look like there's anyone right now. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the board? Any comments or discussion? I have a question. Mm -hmm. This is Lindsay Saunders. So, um, are there other elements of the park that um, uh, naming them individually has been explored? I can probably answer that. I do not believe there have been any, um, at least recent, uh, 
request to name any type of elements within uh, John Shays Memorial Park. Now, there may have been some in the past uh, before my time, but I am unaware of any. Question. So how did this, um, the, the, the movement to name a, a part of it uh, come to be? Just curious. Uh, we received a, um, a request uh, from uh, Mr. Allen uh, okay. to, uh, for the board to consider this naming request of the track. And, and just so you know, Lindsay, that is typical. You know, that's mm -hmm. how that process typically works is that uh, individuals in the community would bring up the request and then mm -hmm. seek, seek others to support that. Got it. Thank you. I have one question, if I may. Sure, Lex, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, is the track currently named John Chavis track, and this would be a renaming, or is the track currently unnamed as part of the larger John Chavis Park, and this would be applying a new name to that portion? That is correct. The track is uh, unnamed, and it's just a part of John Chavis Memorial Park. Okay. Yes, Beverly. Um, I'm going to ask that you send as chair a letter to council advising them of one of the challenges that we face in our meetings. This is not specific to the naming, but the fact that we have people that are on the line and drop off and that it's complicated and the, the difficulty that we have in these important decisions of getting um, public input. Um, because of continuing to um, to utilize um, Zoom meetings, I think needs to be, this is a great example of um, hard to hear all sides of an issue when, um, when people have a difficulty coming into our meetings. So if you would pass that along. I think that's yeah. the case whether they're in person or virtual though, because then someone would have to, you know, travel to city hall and, and possibly get childcare or make arrangements for X, Y, Z to be there in person. So it's really, it goes both ways. I think that's true. Yes. And, and we also do, uh, just as a pointer, we also do post signage at the specific location that's up for the naming. And it gives people who may be there uh, the opportunity to, to learn about this naming request, and then it gives them information on how they can submit either their support or, um, or be against it as well. And so uh, folks can also send us emails uh, or letters uh, to share with you on, to provide what their stance is, is on the naming request. Thanks for that. And I think when it's a little bit, you know, there is some opposition like this, that's why that length of time is, is um, extended to give that opportunity for additional input. But I think it's a good point, Beverly, and that's why I think we're all hoping we can get back to in-person sooner rather than later. And, and Jennifer, I did want to uh, correct myself. I did say that y'all were going to be taking action on this item in September. It's actually gonna be October. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds right, thanks. Any other uh, questions or comments at this time from the board? not seeing any. I think we will move on. Thank, thank you to everyone who came to speak tonight. Um, so next on the agenda. Okay, on the rest of me. No. Just go ahead and hit the lead meeting. Yeah. yeah, thank you for coming. Is the uh, Greenway Safety Report. And we have uh, Lisa and David here to give an update on that, I believe. Actually, I think you skipped. Did I? Yes. Oh. The, the next agenda is actually me, and it's on naming. So <laughs> very relevant topic. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> no, I stayed quiet just knowing I've been involved in this for a while. So uh, thank you. I'm going to share a very short presentation. Okay. Um, thank you. The, this isn't on your work agenda, but it was part of a request through the city's commitment and um, executed agreement with this uh, Dorothea Dix Park Conservancy to actually update our naming donor recognition and uh, sponsorship um, policy. So let me share my screen. Can you 
can you see my screen? Yes. Great. For the end slide. Oh, yeah, you got the end one. And the beautiful Great. skyline. Let me go to slide. Okay, start from the beginning. Okay. Well, thank you. This is just 11 slides. Um, very timely, considering that you're going through a naming request now. Uh, this is a little bit uh, broader in content. It's actually going to focus on not only naming, but how we recognize donors and um, how we work with those people that want to sponsor events and programs. Um, and as I've shared in my intro, it's not a part of your work plan, but we'll, we will seek your support. Um, and it, um, really naming and donor recognition and sponsorship has become very complicated over the last several years. Um, I have a few examples there on the screen. We, um, some are honorary in name, uh, nature. This group, a majority of this group went through uh, renaming of Lane Street. Um, we have these significant sponsorship and partnership agreements uh, recently with Dreamville that you know thousands of people come to. Um, Sassafras Playground was uh, a playground that was done with a lot of donations. And that little picture there is the donor wall. Um, and then we have groups uh, that were, or parks that were named after groups um, decades ago, like Kiwanis Park. So a little bit of background, the naming resolution that we're working off of is 16 years old. The last time it was updated was in 2005. Um, we continue as a department to re, uh, receive a lot of opportunities to talk to groups and individuals um, about opportunities for naming, um, to, uh, to recognize donors and to work with sponsors um, to help offset our cost as a city, <laughs> programs, events, and capital development. Um, so this updated resolution seeks to support um, and clarify those opportunities as they come forward. So we're making an update. Um, it also seeks to um, incorporate aspects of the Dorothea Dix Park Conservancy Memorandum of Agreement that was executed by the Raleigh City Council last year, which in that agreement, the, the city committed to updating this resolution and developing some guidelines and some standards. Um, the resolution we're working off of is a city resolution basically for all facilities. However, we're focusing just on parks. So nothing related to the convention center or any of the theaters and so forth. <clears throat> and I can't see if your hands are raised. Um, so someone just speak up or yell, but uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's 10 slides. So it's pretty short. Um, a little bit about the current naming resolution. Um, it's 2005. This board is responsible for naming all park uh, honorary naming, that's specific, which you are going through with the uh, proposal for the naming of uh, the track. Uh, this group, the board, is responsible for the honorary naming process and makes recommendations to the city council. Honorary naming of other city facilities solely resides with the Raleigh City Council. Uh, <clears throat> however, if someone comes forward and says, I want to give X dollars and I want my name to be, or I want to give something um, to the city. So in-kind gifts for both parks and other city facilities, that is the manager's and the city uh, um, attorney's responsibility to work with council directly on that matter. <clears throat> so what we did as a department, um, and Scott is on the call, he worked with me on this over probably the last eight months, parks and recreation work with our attorney's office, we work with our Department of Transportation, and you're probably wondering why them, because they actually work with advertising and naming on buses and facilities. And so they have a little bit more experience than we do. Um, the Convention Center, because they have naming rights in their facilities, and then our Finance Department. So we basically reached out to others within the city that are doing this to <clears throat> make sure we're not doing anything different, kind of aligned with what they're doing and to seek their, their input. We also reached out um, <clears throat> to the uh, Conservancy uh, so for some of their best practices and research in which they had conducted to um, discuss this with them. So what we have done is we've updated the resolution and I'll go through some of the changes in the next few slides. Um, we still keep um, on two paths. If you're gonna uh, uh, name something from an honorary perspective or something from a monetary or in-kind perspective, <clears throat> But what we did is we created, and this is in your backup, a very comprehensive and robust set of procedures for staff to follow, 
uh, to use as guidelines when these opportunities come forth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Combined, the resolution and the department procedures are basically considered our new policy. <clears throat> so what has changed? One thing has uh, changed was with the creation of Dix Park, there's now a, <clears throat> a, uh, a long-term committee of which um, Jennifer is a part of um, that oversees and advises the council on matters related to Dix Park. So one change we're recommending is that any naming or renaming associated with Dix Park resides with the leadership committee, which Jen would be a part of and can communicate to this board. Um, all other city parks, facilities, and et cetera, for honorary naming still resides with the park board. So that's probably the key change out of all this presentation that affects the parks board is that now that the council has basically um, developed an, an advisory role for the leadership committee, and that committee is interested in being more directly involved in the park, um, we're recommending that honorary naming um, will go through the leadership committee, but we'll work with the board, park board chair or the member of the park board that is on the leadership committee to communicate that through the park board. Hey, Steve, um, can I yeah. jump in real quick? Is the thinking there that that just makes things a little more streamlined because we imagine there will be a lot of naming opportunities? Is that um, the reasoning? Yeah, I think it's twofold. Um, we have we have heard not only from our uh, council representatives and, and from other representatives, they want to be more involved in some of the decisions related to Dix Park. And one of the things that's similar to the park board has is a responsibility for honorary naming. You'll see later on, it monetary name resides with Oscar and the city manager and the city attorney. So the leadership committee will not get into the money side of, of naming. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Does that does that help? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yes. And I have a little graph later on just to show. Cool. Um, one of the things it's interesting that we we heard Beverly talk about is the challenges with technology. Currently, the resolution says we have to take everything in written format. Um, so we're making sure we give opportunities for people to submit things digitally. So we're updating a resolution 16 years old, um, just to say, hey, if you want to su submit a letter, great, but you can also do it um, digitally. Um, we established in the resolution that the department must have procedures related to naming and donor recognition and sponsorship. So it's basically uh, a departmental guidance document and I'd encourage you all to look at it. It's very thorough. Um, one of the things that we changed was that um, groups or individuals could come forward with 25 signatures to rename a small park or a facility. We increased that to 100. If, um, so uh, just for scale, um, uh, if, to me, you could get um, six or seven of your neighbors and have 25 people really quick. So we, we thought 100 is a reasonable number. <clears throat> um, other updates, um, I think you'll, you'll find this interesting. It doesn't say anything about naming forever. So unless expressly approved by council, uh, naming rights will not be forever. So honor, uh, you can rename a park after 100 years if someone chooses to, which we haven't had yet. Um, but the big thing is for, uh, for naming rights for um, money and in-kind uh, gifts, uh, the, the best practices for parks is now deviating to say, if I, I'll say, if I give you a million dollars, will you name that asset after me? Um, well, we have to replace that asset, keep it up. That million dollars goes away pretty quick. So unless the council says they're willing to give away naming rights forever, and perpetuity is hard to find, to define, um, we're, we're going to limit. We're going to create a duration. Um, <clears throat> right now, if someone provide or wants to give money or gifts to the city, um, it requires a two council vote. Um, they vote at one meeting and then they vote at another meeting. Um, we're going to move that to one vote, but what we're going to create is a, uh, a 10 day public notice period that's advertised and we'll create a public hearing in which people can come comment on. <clears throat> and then the council can choose to vote on that day. So that, that's a change. It used to be a two step vote process. Now it's a single vote process, but we're instituting a public notification period and a public hearing period for people to come comment um, at the council meeting. 
And then finally, um, it authorizes the city manager to, de to de delegate some of these responsibilities within the resolution. An example being, uh, it doesn't say it in the resolution a lot, but Oscar is now empowered to do some of these things working with Giovanna and staff. So the departmental procedures, this is seven like really quick bullets. We create definitions. What is a naming right? What is donor recognition? And what is the sponsorship? Um, it says what we're permitted to do and what we're prohibited. So prohibited, I'll use examples, Alco alcohol, tobacco, firearms. We are not going to name things after companies associated with those type of uses. Um, <sighs> additionally, we basically use the term anything that is disparaging or provides a negative depiction to the city, we're not interested. Um, and so it, it's in the documents that are in your backup. Um, it really pushes the, the staff to say, you should have an, an agreement with someone that wants to give you money or in-kind gifts um, and, and make sure that the city is protected and, um, for that. Given the understanding, especially the last few years and the, the public dial, dialogue about um, individuals and groups pasts. Um, we now um, are really uh, looking at how do we terminate the ability to name something after someone who maybe after a period of time we find out we do not want um, something named after them. And then finally, it really just ensures our department is working with the attorneys, working with our finance department and our partners to make sure that any naming or any recognition of a donor or any sponsorship is in the best interest of Raleigh aligns with our values as a city and values as a community. So this is the simple flow chart. So really I think about naming in two pathways. Honorary, that is your role as a board. What we're suggesting is that if it's related to Dix Park, it would come through the leadership committee and then go to the council. <clears throat> if it's related to monetary or in-kind gifts, we utilize these robust procedures. And then it's the manager's responsibility or the designee to bring that to the Raleigh City Council. So what we're asking of you this evening is to support the updated resolution and departmental procedures. Um, next week, we'll go to a leadership committee, the Dix Park Leadership Committee and give a similar presentation. And then our uh, schedule would be to go to the city council in um, July. So I'll stop sharing if that is okay and yeah thank you for that Stephen. sure absolutely sorry me... I, I lost connection there for a minute so sorry if you said this but in both tracks the um administrative procedures are the same is that right as that's far correct. as you can do the, the termination and some of that yeah that's a, that's a great question um so one of the things we wanted to make sure is that um the, the procedures, um, we want consistent procedures for not only um, Dix Park, but the entire park system. At one point we were considering, do we have a set of procedures for Dix Park or, or, for, or for, uh, for the rest of the park system? We were like, what's good for all parks is good for all parks. Um, so um, oh, I'm still sharing the screen, sorry. Let me go back. Pretty, pretty cool and jazzy though. <laughs> Oh, I can't figure out here. Let me, maybe I look. Does anybody for... have any questions for Stephen? Beverly, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Um, are there any um, hmm. prohibitions or well, you said alcohol and firearms and um, yeah, but what about things like Pepsi Cola? And you know, we as we look at health. Um, and well-being of our and uh, Coca-Cola, RC Cola, whatever you know, soft drinks in general. But things that are or Mars candy bars. I mean, do we we? I would think we wouldn't want to name a community center the uh, M&M Community Center. Um, and yeah, you know, that's message. that's a great question. So um, if you look at the the documents in the back. It, it does allow for us to you know. So, if the city has a really big focus on health and wellness, um, do we want to pursue a relationship with Coca Cola or or Pepsi? So, I can't say a no or a yes. That will be something that it's Oscar's responsibility to and the city managers to identify one what is eligible to be named, 
And then two, is it the best interest of the city for us to propose this naming to the Raleigh City Council? So is the juice worth the squeeze, you know, to, 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 to move in that direction? And I guess my follow-up question for that is, is 10 days adequate for commentary for something like that? I, um, having um, served with Ann McLaurin and uh, knowing her very strong opinions on these matters um, on the school board, um, where of course you have a little bit more captive audience and it's a little yeah. different scenario, but these were, issues that we dealt with there and mm -hmm. um and it seems to me that they're pretty important issues that some of the interested parties might not be tuned in to parks and rec happen yeah uh well I'll, i can say there is no notification period right now so that um that's and there's no need there's no public hearing period so what we did is we're proposing these at as a very basic um, the other is that, you know, the council, that they have the ability to discuss these things in closed session because they are an economic development related item. So um, not that they will choose to do this in all cases, but there might be a significant donor that comes forward that does not want their name put out there. And it might be months in advance. Um, but if they, let's say we reconcile, we come to an agreement with that donor, then their name has to be put out there for 10 days in a notification and the ability for uh, the community to say, I agree or disagree with that. Any other questions? All right. Well, I, uh, there, is an, uh, there isn't a required action because this isn't part of your work plan, but we do have um, a recommendation to seek uh, your support if you're interested in doing so. Would anyone like to make a motion to um, recommend approval? Marsha is. I so move. Thank you. Second. Lindsay seconded. Um, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. Please. Aye. Aye. Now, all against, Aye. raise your hand and say nay. Christina, did you vote? I didn't, I think she may have frozen. <laughs> yep, we lost. <clears throat> okay. We might need to redo that vote because I'm, or, well, I guess we have a quorum at this, we have more than, more than a quorum at this point, so we should be good. Okay. All right, well. Thank you very much. If you have any naming questions, Scott and I have spent a lot of time on this, so <laughs> we'll, we'll help you in any way we can. So. Thank you for all the materials and for the succinct presentation. Much appreciated. Sure. Thanks for your work on this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So the movement passed. Um, now we have the Greenway Safety Report. Lisa. That's me <laughs> on deck. Um, so my name is Lisa Schaffauer. I don't, I, I know most of you here, but I think there's a few in here that, that don't know me. I'm a senior engineering supervisor for Raleigh Parks, and I primarily oversee the capital area greenway planning, design, and construction. Um, we also have David Hamilton, um, our greenway manager here, and Major Derek Dyke of the Raleigh Police Department. They're also here to present sections of the Greenway Safety Report and presentation to you tonight. Um, we also have two other guests from Raleigh Police Department that are on the call, Deputy Chief Todd Jordan and Deputy Chief Scott. I, I'm going to butcher this last name, so I apologize in advance, but Oyster Hoyt. <laughs> and so we have them with us. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> so our presentation, and most of you have seen a lot of this information, <clears throat> but it's an overview of the draft safety report 
and you received <clears throat> a copy of that draft safety report in your meeting documentation. <clears throat> and of course, I'd get a frog in my throat as soon as I began. <clears throat> um, so this report, so like the reason why we're here, uh, the report was prepared in response to growing community and city council concern over my safety. We had an unfortunate and isolated event that occurred last year on the Walnut Creek section of the Greenway. Um, and we had had several injuries um, over the past couple of years that has brought awareness to city council regarding primarily user conflicts. So for those reasons, council requested that the parks board review the safety measures that are in place with our department um, for city, and, then, and the Parks Board deferred that review to the Greenway Committee. The Greenway Committee, which several of you on this board are also part of that um, group, uh, and also there are several members of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission that are on the Greenway Committee. And we met over um, several months at the beginning of this year um, to review the information. So I want to um, thank the Greenway Committee for their oversight and input. So um, what we're looking at today is staff is recommending approval on this report and then re the referral to the City Council for their, for their review. And we're going to be asking Council for their review and um, giving the staff direction to implement prioritized improvements. So the draft include, or the report includes several sections here that I've outlined. Um, I'm going to go first because the process starts with our with our group. So planning and design, safety education, aware and awareness kind of comes just throughout the, the capital area greenway programming, uh, maintenance and operations. David Hamilton will cover that. Um, Major Derek Dyke will cover Raleigh Police Department initiatives, and then lastly, we will talk about ongoing and future recommendations. So where we started in our Greenway safety discussions with the Greenway Committee was defining safety. We discussed safety in both terms of personal and physical safety. With personal safety, it generally described as general recognition and avoidance of possible harmful situations. So, so being alert and aware of people around you, educating yourself concerning prevention tactics, um, such as using the greenways with a buddy or not wearing um, headphones and being aware of situations and locations which can make you vulnerable. So physical safety is described as um, absence of harm or injury that can be experienced from the physical environment. So thinking about adjacent of a greenway to vehicular traffic or protruding elements or tripping hazards. And so why is safety important? I think that's an important question to answer. Um, so there's personal safety that is real and perceived. And that heavily influences how a greenway, well, if a greenway, if a, a user is going to use the facility. If we don't want to, uh, if, we, if we implement these things and make them safe, then that promotes, um, ownership of the trail and more people on the trail that then, then puts more eyes on the trail. We put a lot of work in our planning and our maintenance of those trails. So without the uh, responsibilities, responsibility of putting things in place that give people an overall general feeling of safety, then our work would be useless. <laughs> so in addition to personal safety, the physical safety of users also influences uh, a person's decision to use the facility. So um, throughout our process, looking at how we can minimize external factors, um, conflicts with external factors, such as minimizing um, user conflicts. We have bikers, walkers, bird watchers, scooters, skateboards, strollers. And that's really just naming a few of the uses that are on our Greenway system but also conflicts with the volume of people, uh, conflicts with vehicular traffic, 
So, <clears throat> so as we plan and design these facilities, you know, incorporating elements into the design that help minimize those um, conflicts is something that we strive and implement um, all the time. And these facility, facilities should also be accessible and easy to use. Um, it should allow uh, us to, um, it should permit an array of people of all ages and abilities to use the facility with minimal inconveniences. So, <clears throat> uh, getting into some details here. Uh, so, <clears throat> this is a list of guidance that's used in our design process. We really start with these, but our capital area green planning design guide that was adopted in 2014. That document provide, provides parameters for implementing consistent character throughout the Greenway system. Um, but we have to be mindful that the Capital Greenway system uh, provides many uh, functions. So recreation to the access and access to the outdoors, environmental protection and uh, conservation, and providing a multimodal option. So they have to be designed, maintained, and operated to balance all of those. So the guide includes all of these other lists of guidance, um, but I highlighted on this first slide the, the top-notch ones that we use. And then you get into additional state guidelines, um, building code, local code. But the one thing I wanted to point out is that we do learn from each and every project. And we, we, we have a lessons learned process. So as we move to the next, uh, we try to use those teaching moments. And each project is unique and we not, may not be able to apply every standard, um, but we do um, start with, you know, the primar primarily the ones that um, help address some of these big issues. Um, let's see. <clears throat> and then the other thing I that is item that's important is that we coordinate with other departments, primarily transportation. And so every project that we have, we're incorporating somebody on that staff to be part of our reviews. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are some pictures. I'd rather put pictures up than words. But so the signage one in the left hand corner, we say signage is a is a big way opportunity to uh, implement safety into our into our designs. So uh, having the repetition of signage helps with people using the trail and identifying they're on the capital area greenway system. Uh, markers such as where a road is and the distance to get there. This is a sign that uh, we installed a few years ago and we continuously look for opportunities to improve and I'll show you a design concept that we're soon gonna be implementing that provides more information. So not only is it critical that trail users know um, where they are from signage, um, but it really is a key element to a sense of safety. Uh, other types of um, elements, visibility, um, having clear sight lines, um, that's necessary in design and maintenance. Uh, Items such as just handrail, right? So in some of these environments where we have streams so close and we have limited space, that handrailing is there to um, provide safety from the slope on your side. And then 
I mentioned vertical barriers. So bollards are necessary um, to keep cars out, but in some cases they can be um, a hazard because um, you know everybody's identifying or looking for them. We went through a whole process of like trying to figure out what the appropriate size was for a bollard. And I, I'd still have to look up <laughs> the, the height, but it's somewhere around 21 inches, something like that. But also placing the elements. So like the boulders that you see and where you put the benches, making sure they're far enough off, off the trail. And then the last one, it's like my favorite, this is structure 98 on the New Super Trail in Headingham. And so one thing that we're doing is as we renovate a trail, or have a new project, very rare will you find timber as part of that design. You're gonna, you're gonna see and, and have been seeing concrete. Concrete is less uh, slippery, um, it's less maintenance. Um, so those kind of elements we are incorporating. So user conflicts are a huge um, issue within our system. We have 10 foot, primarily 10 foot trails. So as we go to make improvements to those sections, we'll be looking at widening. Um, and that will help a lot with the user conflicts. But for now, striping these trails where you have curves, where you have uh, where you have high use, um, such as our loops, we've already Im been implementing some of that. I think over the next year, you're going to see a lot more of this. Um, I mentioned working with transportation, and we work with them on the best way to handle crossings when it cross, when crosses road. This is Strickland Road, East Fork Mine Creek, and Honeycutt. So this was initially in the design, it was a, uh, a pedestrian activated crossing. So when a person was standing there, the, the other side would stop the traffic. It was different lights. And so, as we were able to determine more users using this, we were able to upgrade the system or the crossing to a more robust system. And I talked about amenity placement, uh, having things like your, your tire pump stations, just such a minor detail, but very important in providing safety. And then public art. This is a tunnel um, off of Walnut Creek. And we're, we're working with our, our art folks and trying to implement a lot of this because it, it does, it, it naturally, when you see art along the trails, whether it's painted manhole or painted tunnel, there's, there's something to that that really provides that, that better sense of safety. So these are some of the improvements that we're working on now. Uh, so we're starting with three tunnels along Walnut Creek. We have a contractor, we're routing the contract. We should have licensed the three remaining Walnut Creek tunnels uh, by the end of summer. There are a total of, after that, there's six more that we will be working on lighting. We are transitioning all the tunnels to LED lights, which is gonna help with maintenance and also going 24 seven hours of operation or lighting, not for use yet. <clears throat> so we have a couple of projects um, that are on the horizon, Lasser Mill, uh, a gap within the capital or the Crouchy Creek Greenway, we're gonna be making some AD improvements. Our uh, Crouchy Creek realignment near Capitol Boulevard, We'll be addressing resiliency of our, of our system. Um, some cases we're trying to balance having the experience adjacent to stream belt, stream banks where there are issues, and so that we have a more substantial facility. 
we are looking at widening pavement in areas where there's insufficiency, um, improving site visibility with these projects as well. And I talked about pavement markings. So safety education, awareness, and outreach. I just finished up the planning and design section. Uh, just want to go over some of the initiatives that <clears throat> the Parks Department is working on. We just completed our safety and etiquette campaign. Uh, we kicked that off in March, um, March 21st. It was about a month long. The objective was to help increase awareness and greenway safety and etiquette. Um, we, we had some learning moments from that process. Um, nothing bad, but when, for example, just being out on the trail and trying to do the campaign, a lot of people were stopping and asking, nope, not a question that had to do with the Greenway. So um, just finding ways to improve that. And that's something that we are looking to continue to do. I mentioned signage improvements. I'm gonna show you a few slides. Um, you know, things like handing out promotional items like bike bells and explaining to people why a bike bell is important. Uh, our webpage includes rule safety and etiquette and safety PSAs. Um, we have some closure and alerts for map uh, of a map that has really been helpful um, to people that they could just go to the website and, uh, and get the information themselves. So um, some of the key themes for the safety and etiquette campaign, there's a lot of social media that had gone out with these key themes. Um, we had a, 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 a photo contest um, as part of that. And again, we think that that went well. We, we will look for ways to improve it as we implement that in the future. So this is one of our signs <laughs> that we are working on getting manufactured. So this sign will consolidate um, some individual regulation signs that we have. <clears throat> so like speed limit sign that we have on the system, instead of having three different signs, this is, would be um, reducing that sign clutter. And then um, with the sign, we'll focus on high utilization areas where we have gaps in the system and where we have frequent reports of speeding. Sorry about the fuzziness of this photo. Um, just realized that. But these are new. One on the left is a pedestrian directional sign. So it's going to include, it's, it's, it's similar to our pedestrian directional that's higher, um, same information, but this sign puts it more at eye level. It does include distance to variety of destinations. Um, and then it will also include, uh, this one doesn't have it. So when I give this presentation at council, be sure to include the correct one, but providing icons like where there are restroom facilities so people will know um, where those are. And these will be placed at um, key decision points um, strategically. And then the subway, subway style sign on your right, this is something um, it's new, new. And so what this sign does is it's, it's very similar to what we call it a subway style, style sign. Hopefully everybody's been on a subway. And, uh, and, it, and those signs, are really great, the maps, because they show you kind of where, where to get off and your destinations. And this will, um, this is designed to allow more local information on, on this map than what's available on the kiosk. It'll include distances to destinations. And so really excited about this particular map. We are gonna pilot these signs and get some feedback on them. Um, just from the community before we start implementing them throughout the entire system. <clears throat> and I think this is the last slide. So um, it's just a clip it from our, our website. 
that where I know people don't go to the website to get safety and etiquette. That is why it's important that we do all these other things on top of it. This is not the begin all end all, just showing as an example of that. Um, this is a little video um, PSA that we put out Growing two years ago. Play it really quickly. Department like you to enjoy the many miles of greenway trails. There are a few things you need to know before visiting the trails. Here are a few tips to help everyone enjoy the trails. Be aware of your surroundings. Always be aware of other users on the trails, whether they are ahead of you or approaching from behind. When wearing headphones, be sure to keep the volume to a level where you can hear the other users approaching and or if they'd like to pass. Walk with a buddy. The greenways are safe and beautiful to enjoy, but they are always safer and more enjoyable to experience with a buddy. We hope to see you on the trail soon. For more information about the city of Raleigh's greenways, please visit us online at arts.raleighnc.gov. Don't forget to share your experience on social media. Find us, like us, follow us. So that is um, those PSAs we uh, will periodically put out on our social media um, and, and re-advertise those. The map on the right is a map that you'll find on our main uh, Greenway page. And um, you know the, the GIS folks in our department uh, have helped us with this and we're continuing to make it better. Uh, but it provides um, a red highlight where you might have a closure, a uh, different color for where you might have a detour. And then it provides just you know some, some basic information about why there's a closure. And I can tell you that this, is, this has been a great feature we can point people to. Um, we still get phone calls, but we'll still answer those. Um, so that wraps up my portion of um, the presentation. I will um, move over and allow David to um, begin. And David, if you could just tell me when you want me to advance. OK, thank you. All right, so um, I'm David Hamilton. I'm the Greenway Manager. Um, I've got just a few slides to go over with you tonight. We've kind of condensed it from the last time we presented. Um, so consistent and routine maintenance is critical for the physical safety of the green for the greenway users. This contributes to the comfort and high quality experiences users have throughout the system. We work every day to make sure the trails are safe, accessible, clean, beautiful, and ready for the public. It also contributes to the health and sustainability of the natural environment. You can go to the next one. I think you skipped one there. Sorry about that. That's all right. I don't know what happened there. Oh, uh, that's our next one. maintenance team, it's uh, made up of four crews uh, with specific duties and responsibilities. Um, the crews are our construction crew, grounds maintenance crew, a structure crew, and a vegetation crew. Each team is made up of highly skilled professionals from our maintenance workers, equipment operators, and carpenters. We also have certified arborists as well as licensed pesticide applicators. These crews daily tasks range from turf maintenance, trash collection, erosion repair, structure repair to storm response. In addition to our four crews, we work hand in hand with the planning department on work outside the scope of maintenance, such as stream bank restorations, plan reviews, um, new trail installations, and some of our trail parking lot counters program we have going on currently. Next. So we have a couple of different ways we uh, take information from our, uh, our inspections. Um, we're always looking for ways to become more efficient with greenway maintenance. One way is how we collect data during inspections. We are currently using multiple methods of collection depending on the inspection type because each application serves us in a different way. We inspect all bridges and boardwalks, asphalt and vegetation in-house twice a year using a CityWorks and a collector app to record our results and GPS the findings. Once a year, we contract with an outside engineering firm to inspect select structures. We use this as a checks and balance for our inspections, as well as to get updated load ratings for each structure. 
After all storms, large or small, we will complete an inspection to see what type of damage is out there and where we need to focus our efforts. All the inspections performed helped to set the crew's work schedules going forward for repairs and maintenance. Our goal is to make all needed repairs collected between each uh, cycle of inspections. Next. So here's a few pictures of just some of the stuff we find after a storm inspection. Um, kind of going from left to right. The top picture is where you will have high water flow real quick and it's uh, picked up the asphalt and moved it to the side. The picture to the, I'm sorry, to the right is the handrail at Hammond Road, just outside Hammond Road Tunnel. When we get a lot of high water, it'll collect debris against that rail, cause a lot of pressure, which push that rail off that structure. Um, the next one to the right is a silt deposit on the trail. So that's probably about eight to 10 inches of silt that we have to go in with skid steers, collect, remove, and then sweep the trail. The only good part to this is we take that silt and turn it into yard waste. They screen it and then we top dress our ball fields with this. Um, the next picture is a section of trail that's underwater right after a rain event. And then the last one is Hammond Road Tunnel. There's a silt deposits in there after most rain events. We typically have to go in there with skid steers, get the silt out, then we go back in and wash the complete tunnel. Um, all of these pictures are small representations of what we find after heavy rainstorms throughout the trail system. This is not from a hurricane or a real large event. Like I say, it's just quick, heavy rains. And all these pictures are just a small portion of it. And this is only Walnut Creek Trail. Next. Sorry about that. So traction. Oops. So traction findings, that's been a big issue for us. Um, so there are many reasons for slippery or slick conditions along the trail. Organic materials, silt, and algae are just a few reasons users experience issues along the system. Other traction related issues are usually related to, to the speed of users and just general conge congestion. While there are other solutions, pressure washing is one of the most effective treatments against slips. We have conducted risk assessment on all the structures in the Greenway system to help prioritize when and how often we need to pressure wash a, stru a structure. A couple other materials we have in our toolbox and are still using are traction tape and metal stair tread treatments. Traction tape is proving to work in the right conditions. This material works better when applied to an aged board where expansion and contraction is at a minimum. When used on new lumber, we have found that the tape will bubble and peel, causing issues of its own. We are also using stainless steel metal strips on all stair treads. This will allow a person's foot to have a better grip when wet conditions are present. Now the stainless steel stair treads is a new treatment we're doing. And so we, are, we have it on a couple sets. We're waiting for the rest of the material to get in so we can apply it to all the stairs within our greenway system. Next. And this is our last one, increasing eyes on the greenway. It's kind of a big focus for us here the past couple of years. It's our belief that if we can create points of interest on the trail, it'll create increased usage in that area. The more interest created, the safer people will feel and the lower amounts of questionable activities will take place is our thought. The greenway division is dedicated to promoting native flowers and grasses throughout the capital area greenway system. To do this, select areas have been removed from the monthly mowing rotation. This action will increase wildlife habitat, protect native pollinators, improve water quality, reduce air pollution, and provide more opportunities to experience nature while on the trail. These natural areas will now be mowed annually opposed to their original four week cycle. So currently we have four uh, managed wildflower plots, seven annual plots, and then 25 conservation mowing areas. Um, art on the trail, like Lisa mentioned earlier, is also a big focus, which brings attention. Um, currently, there's the tunnel at Rocky Branch Trail, and there's sewer risers that have, have paintings like the one you see on the screen 
on Mine Creek Trail and Noose River Trail. Next. Is that it, All David? Right. Yes. So, um, Major Derek Dyke, you're on. All right, thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm uh, Derek Dyke. I'm one of the majors for the police department. And I'm going to discuss with you some of the initiatives that we have uh, as it relates to the greenways. So in support of the, the city strategic plan, uh, the police department collaborates with other departments to help promote a safe and vibrant atmosphere uh, throughout the city by educating community members on city services, amenities, and the latest safety measures that help support this thriving community. Uh, I'm going to discuss some of those initiatives. Um, the first of those uh, is the Greenway Volunteer Program. In 2012, the Raleigh Police Department Greenway Volunteer Program was formed. This program utilizes volunteers who are active Greenway users to help monitor trail activity from a safety standpoint, including the proper use of trails and practicing proper etiquette. Uh, they serve as ambassadors for the Raleigh Police Department by offering assistance, answering questions, providing directions, and distributing maps. Uh, over 51,000 hours of volunteer service have been donated to date saving the city of Raleigh approximately $1.26 million. Uh, currently, there are 40 Greenway volunteers. This is down from 80 uh, due to the COVID pandemic. However, as the restrictions regarding COVID have eased, we've been able to restart the program and are actively seeking volunteers again. Um, next slide, please. So uh, um, the Raleigh Police Department employs intelligence-led policing. Uh, crime analysts use predictive analysis to determine where and when crimes are most likely to occur by overlaying crime trend maps with the Greenway Trail maps to determine crime hotspots. Officers are then strategically deployed to these locations to deter criminal activity at the times and locations where these incidents are most likely to occur. Officers determine additional engagement opportunities while out on patrol by linking those in need with the resource most appropriate to the circumstance encountered. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, uh, next slide, please. For the purpose of this presentation, calls for service queries were completed for the city's greenways for the six month period between September of 2020 and February of 2021. Uh, the calls for service that had the highest frequency of occurrences are larceny from motor vehicle, which is the theft of valuables from that vehicle, uh, miscellaneous call for service where there's actually no offense or a talk with an officer. This is usually through reports, suspicious activity or damage to the trail. And the last would be damage to property. And this is usually when uh, there's a report of damage to a vehicle as a result of an attempted break in or theft. Next slide, please. The, oh, I'm sorry, can you go back one? I apologize. Uh, the Lock It or Lose It program uh, is the most successful campaign against auto crimes and vehicle break ins. It has reduced auto theft and vehicle break ins by 85%. Through citizen education and the use of awareness signs, the Locker Loser program has helped to reduce three out of four auto theft and vehicle break-ins that would normally occur. This program empowers the community to reduce crimes by limiting an offender's ability to commit crimes of opportunity. By locking your vehicle, hiding, mm -hmm. or taking your belongings with you, you help reduce the ability for a thief to commit these types of crimes. Uh, and the, the last thing I'd like to mention, and it's sort of an add-on, so I apologize that it's not actually in the PowerPoint, is the, the new, uh, Park Police Unit that the City Council just approved, um, and you know we're very thankful for the City Council's generosity in funding this new unit. Um, the mission of this unit will be geared toward the safety of those who access our greenways and parks. It will be staffed by six full-time sworn officers and a supervisor. Um, but I will say that with over 117 miles of greenway and over 200 parks in the city, there's no way that that just these seven people can be everywhere all the time. Uh, in addition to using intelligence-led policing. We're still going to rely heavily on our volunteers, our community partners, citizens, uh, and other city departments to ensure that our citizens are free to safely enjoy all that our greenway system has to offer. Um, we will soon be in the process of selecting and staffing that unit, and we're looking forward to be able to roll out and introduce them to the community in the very near future. Uh, and that's that's all I have unless there are any questions. I'd like to um, move on to our next few slides and we'll take some questions afterwards if that's okay. Okay. We could get to the next slide. Okay. So this is, oh, I think I missed one. Okay, there we go. Um, 
All right. So, so the last two slides just sort of summary of the ongoing and future recommendations. I'm not gonna read each one of them. Um, they're also in the in the report. Um, but I think the takeaway here is that we're always looking to continuously improve. And we have done that over the last year, um, just with our awareness that safety matters and it's important. And it's really all of our focus, David's focus, RPD's focus. And so we'll continue to collaborate, find ways to make improvements and continue to um, utilize best practices for how we do things. So with that, I'll go to the last slide. Um, if anybody has any questions about these uh, ongoing and future recommendations, we can discuss that. But I really love this picture. Um, and so here are my contact information, David's and, and Derek's. So um, we'll take questions now if anybody has any. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Officer Dyke and David. Does anyone have any questions? Beverly. Well, I just want to tell David that I was on uh, the Greenway riding with four riders this morning and out on the far end of uh, Crabtree um, Trail and they were mowing and they were so courteous every time that I don't, I don't it's, I'm sure it slows them down, but they always made sure that the exhaust in was turned away from, from walkers and riders and it just, it was noticeable how, um, you know, we waved, we said, thank you. We were, um, but they were extremely courteous. And so I think that's, um, you know, I want them to, you to pass that along that we appreciate that. I definitely will. That's a huge focus for us as customer service while they're out there working. Yeah, well, they, they were doing it. The one signage question I had for Lisa was that example of the Walnut Creek, the one that was on the left. Um, it listed a lot of places that you could get to. And it said, for instance, um, Meredith College, 7.5 miles, but you really can't get to Meredith on the the uh, Walnut Creek, so wouldn't it wouldn't you want to add something to that sign that added via Rocky Branch or something so that you can show people that you can't that I th I think that may end up being so that example of a sign is like the worst it would get right <laughs> like it's Good. a lot of information um, but I I think if you start adding more text I think what's important is once you get to that another decision-making point, you say Meredith College yeah. that way, right? right? So that's part of our signage is like, we can hire, we could have one person work on signage 100% of the time. Um, but those are the kinds of things that we're looking at as we put these signs in like the next destination, the next decision point, is there, or information there that's getting people to those destinations. Yeah, Lisa, if I could piggyback on that, I was going to comment on the same thing, Beverly, that I think that was way too, too many names to have <laughs> or places to have on one sign. And so the question is, how often are those signs going to be placed or located so that you could hopefully, you know, winnow that down to really just what's in the next two or three miles and then have another maybe, right. a, like you said, a decision point. Yeah, um, that shows you what what else is down the road. And I think those subway maps are great to show the overall if you want to look at it and say, Oh, wow, I could get all the way to Meredith College if I then get on the rocky branch, then that that helps to resolve that without having to list each and every place yes. that you could possibly get to. Yeah, and having an overall map so that you could if you need it, just get to wherever yeah. you can be able to see it. Yeah, I, I again, we're, we're, we're trying to look we're looking at it holistically um, and it's and it's and it's been so, sort of a learning process because when you're you're 
when you're a person that's doing the signage, like, you know, you have to go out into the space and you have to look, and you have to put yourself in other people's shoes of, you know, being on a trail and trying to get to a destination. So um, that's something um, that we are paying attention to. And hopefully with these new signs that are rolling out, that it addresses a lot of those concerns. And again, it's not gonna be perfect, but we'll, we'll continue towards being close to perfect. <laughs> Um, any other comments or questions from the presentation? Um, yeah. Yes, I've got my hand up. Lindsay, okay, go ahead. And then Brad did as well. Um, uh, I've got two items. Um, the first one is to add to uh, the sign collection. Um, people frequently get lost at Lake Lynn. They they come in on the, the um, I guess it's the, the uh, rate Ray Road or Lynn Road parking lot. And um, I just know where it is. I always forget. No, it's on Lynn Road. Yeah. So they come in there and then they walk around and then they keep going and they end up at the community center, which you do enter from Ray Road. That's the one. Um, so um, a couple weeks ago, I redirected a woman. Nope, keep going that way. This is the way to a different section. And even my own mother has gotten lost out there and had to be redirected back and around. So um, added to the collection, I'm sure there's a pile of signs. You're right, you could just keep adding, but keep going that way to go back to the Lynn Road parking lot, this way to the community center off of Ray Road. Um, yeah, but um, the question I have is, how will determination for police coverage be assessed? So uh, are, you, are you referring specifically to the, the new park police unit? Yes, you said six full-time and a supervisor of police officers for the parks and greenway right. system. So wondering how will you determine coverage and how will it circulate? Um, I mean, I've run into police officers hanging out on motorcycles on the Greenway, but I don't think that they were uh, they were there for who knows what reason. I don't know. I didn't ask that. I just kept going. But this is a specific. Right. So, how will you determine where they go and um, what they cover? So we haven't we haven't gotten there yet. Again, we just got the approval last week, and so we're we're still in all of that is still in a planning phase. So I, I'm I'm sorry to say, but more to follow. <laughs> Understandable. Thank you. <laughs> I thought your uh, statistics officer Dyke on the lock it or lose it program and how much that seems to have contributed to um, reducing theft were really interesting. How is, that seems like the same thing that we see signage for in town that says something different but similar, right? Cover it, yeah. put it away, lock it. <laughs> yeah, lock, take and hide was the old program. Okay. And so I guess this is just you know, everything is reinvented and everything that's old is new again. Okay. And so this is just a more modern version of that same program. I see. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Brad, go ahead. Sorry. No, no worries. I, I, I liked it a lot. I, I, it's not news to anybody on this call that I like destinations and emphasizing destinations on the Greenway and how we do that. And, um, you know, I'd like, uh, it'd be great if we got some uh, sunflowers back um, uh, over on the east side because um, that was a big thing and then Dick stole it I know that's fine anyway um, but it'd be nice to have destinations like that and have sort of dedicated spots especially in areas where there's some concern um, where you could target people to come in um, and add a little safety features there the only other thing I was going to note is in my uh, explorations um, down on Walnut Creek I know there have been uh, a lot of LED lighting added um, and there's a few places where it's been added rather haphazardly. I don't know if that's just on purpose just to get it done, um, but the original lighting um, looked like it could survive like a nuclear holocaust and the um, new lighting is like very flimsy wire that looks like it could be easily snipped. So it went from like super conduit to just very flimsy wire and the flimsy wire makes sense because it's LED, but it could also be easily snipped and on a long um, tunnel uh, like Hammond Road. Um, that can be a little disconcerting um, because it could be easy, easily um, sort of destroyed. 
uh, I know it was just connected into the old system. It looked like it was just connected into an old light and the whole thing was in there. Um, but there is some just protection needs for some of those new LED lights that are going in, which are great, um, but they're just not as protected as the original uh, conduit was. Anyway. Brad, I can, I, can, I can look into that. Um, it's not David's group that manages managing that project. It's our facilities group. So, and quite honestly, I don't know anything about lighting. I mean, I do. I know. Oh, I don't even answer that, anything. But... I just wanted to highlight that, like, yeah, it's a, it's a safety concern. I know that we're putting energy into putting the lighting in, but it looks like it's just getting tacked into the old conduit, and then the wire just wanders over to the new LEDs, which is great. The LEDs are awesome, but uh, the the wire is really tiny. <laughs> and easy to grab. Thanks for <laughs> about that. Marcia, do you have a question? Just an observation. My husband is a uh, avid cycler and bicycle rides his bicycle on the greenways and he's complained about um, the light differential. Lighting will help with tunnels and people walking two by two in a tunnel and instead of or, or on the wrong side, you know, I, I like those signs that you're going to put on the greenway that tell people to stay in the left, right side, left side. But he has felt like that he could have really hurt someone or been hurt himself because of people, um, the light differential as he's been in the sunlight and going into a dark tunnel and or coming out, but it has happened that he's almost hit people that they're walking on the wrong side um, in a dark tunnel. And uh, so um, that, uh, it's amazing. There's probably not more incidents of people getting hurt like that. So hurry and get those uh, little foot pad marker things to help remind folks. Thank you. I really appreciate the presentation. It was very informative. Thank you. Beverly, as, as the chair of the Greenway Committee, do you have any thoughts or um, would you, are you interested in putting forward a recommendation at this time that we, we move forward to approve this um, presentation to go to council? I think that is the intent of today's um, presentation. So yes, mm -hmm. um, I will move approval of this to, the, um, to, to present to council. Unless there's any other comments, does anyone want to second that? A second. Second. Okay. Lindsay with a close follow by Lex. <laughs> um, all those in favor of approving this to go forward to council, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any against, please raise your hand and say nay. Great. Not hearing any. Uh, it, has been approved to move forward. Motion is passed. Can I can I make one comment to Lisa or David or uh, Stephen or whomever? And that is the coordination with public utilities. You know, there's a big project right now on the News River Trail, closing it at Pool Road from um, June one to September one. I was at Anderson Point this morning, and um, there was a guy saying. How, I can't go down there, how do I get? And so we told him go back on Crabtree, take Shanta, take Sunny Brook and you'll catch on to Walnut Creek. But there's no deep, there's little information, a little teeny sign telling you it's blocked uh, on the little political kind of sign. There's a big sign that says closed, but there's no detour information and people aren't gonna pull up there the there's no I don't think there's any detour information on the website either and well, providing and, that, and it's a public utilities project not a greenways closure project so I think there needs to maybe they need to hire a cyclist out there to uh, tell them what the alternatives are uh Beverly did you did you figure out a detour because yeah. Yes, you go back, you go down Crabtree, you go to where it comes, comes to Milburney, you take Shanta Road up to Newburn and across on Sunnybrook, and you come down to uh, Walnut Creek. I mean, it's not all Greenway, 
But uh, Sunnybrook, I think, ha is, you know, it, it, they're two very, it's not a lot of road. I think the and biggest there, issue was, I don't know if there's a post crosswalk at the Millburn and Shanty, is it? There's that's not. That's our issue. Yeah, that's the, the big thing that we struggle with, Beverly, is that the city's not wanting to recommend a detour that puts people in harm's way. So unless there are cro established crosswalks or a bike lane or a sidewalk, um, we probably won't recommend that detour because we're going to say, go this way, even though there is not, um, we'll say, like traffic controls or adopted best practices to get you safely there. Uh, but what we can do is uh, increase the visibility of the, 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 the signage. And that's, that's a, a great suggestion because we, we struggle with people saying, I can get around there, but, we'll work, but you, and you, you're willing to do that as an experienced cyclist. But if someone who is not goes up and then they try to cross someplace where there's not a crosswalk, we've recommended a route, which is really not safe. So that's, that's like the balance that we're we're struggling with right now. And, and there's very few instances, but they're becoming more and more with the utility improvement. Well, I think what it, yeah, there's a lot of public utility improvement all over. But I think then if there were a map of the greenway of that area, that somebody could look at it them, on themselves and make their own determination of roads that were available and greenways right. and hot, and then they could, do that but you know i'm looking at this guy's phone showing him yeah um, what to do and uh well that's that's a good that's a great recommendation maybe we just we just say here's a map <laughs> yeah you go, if, if you yeah. want to go that way we just don't recommend that the, the direction that's that's actually a, a, a great recommendation so thank you yeah okay. we get a lot of people saying we can go this way why don't you just put it down but if there's no crosswalk we are not going to say cross you know, three or four lanes of traffic. Um, <laughs> as a, I mean, Bernie is never going to justify it. At least that end of Mel Bernie is never going to get a, a crosswalk unless yeah. you just chose to put one there. Which and there's more improvements coming, uh, public utility improvements coming to the new. So we're, we're we're trying to be much more proactive in those. But that's a great suggestion. Just say, here's a map. Um, you want to get from point A to point B. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. I'm doing a lot of training right now, so I'm out there every day. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is great. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everyone, for the report and all the hard work on that. Much appreciated. Uh, next on the agenda, we have an update from Oscar on COVID accomplishments uh, throughout the year by staff. Oscar? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, can I get a thumbs up? Can everybody see my screen? All right, great, thank you. Uh, the, the, the title of this presentation is Surviving and Thriving During a Pandemic. Um, it's been quite a year. Uh, it's been over a year uh, since the first COVID case was diagnosed here in Wake County. And during that time, um, it, it has really, uh, has only served to highlight what we have known for years. Parks and recreation is vital to the community. As we navigated the challenges this pandemic brought, we at the department found that regardless of the circumstances, we persevere. Last year, 390 youth and 34 adult teams participated in our fall 2020 athletic leagues. We had no game cancellations, no team quarantines, no postponements. This spring, we're continued with league programs and even reopened the much anticipated Walnut Creek Athletic Complex to start hosting tournaments again. We served a vital need last winter, providing winter coats to over 300 families through our Coats Cause We Care program. And in addition to that, over 50 families participated in our Toys for Tots, uh, ensuring that children would have presents for the holidays. Our inclusion support team 
made sure that accommodations were in place across all of last year's summer camp operations. Uh, so when students went to virtual learning in our centers, these accommodations were available to them. While the business of parks and recreation carries on regardless of the situation, we knew we had to pivot. We updated our policies and procedures to re safely return staff, volunteers, and patrons back into our programs. Meetings became virtual. Our first staff meeting was kind of like herding cats, but we got through it. And now we have mastered it. Clients who were continuing to seek financial assistance were able to use Zoom or other virtual means to continue meeting with our program administrator, Debbie Houston. Instead of full in-person construction site inspections, we adapted with video and photo documentation. Through it all, we were able to complete multiple projects, including neighborhood, community, and aquatic centers, upgrades, greenway repairs, and more. Pictured here are just some of the projects that were realized during the midst of the pandemic. John Chaves Memorial Park, Pullen Arts Center, renovations to Biltmore Hills Park, and the new Riverbend Park. Despite the uncertainty of this past year, our department accomplished a lot. The Parks Department never stopped working even during the pandemic. They never stopped providing litter service in our parks and greenways early on. They also replaced and replanted all planters on Fayetteville Street uh, damaged during the course of the summer. They continued beautifying the city by planting spring and annual flowering bulbs, mulching beds at the Wake County Courthouse, the Raleigh Convention Center, and the Performing Arts Center. As a school system struggled with virtual versus in-person learning, our staff created natural and historical videos and curriculum for Wake County Public School System. Early on in the pandemic, when the CDC confirmed that pools were, were safe, we reopened them. Our seasonal and year-round pools welcomed 28,000 visitors last year. The number of pool visitations was over the period of July 6th through September 7th of 2020. One of our patrons and her son did lap swimming every Friday night at Pool and Aquatics. As she said, it was so good to have a little normalcy during these uncertain times. Similarly, in June of 2020, our tennis centers reopened and saw record a record increase of about 22% participation in our programs. During the pandemic, we were also awarded with a coveted National Youth Sports Strategy Championship by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for promoting youth sports. It is a shared goal that one day, all youth will have the opportunity, motivation, and access to play sports, regardless of their race, ethnicity, sex, ability, financial situation, or zip code. We also quickly learned that, we, that our staff are nimble. We are nimble as an organization during the pandemic. We created COVID policy signage and waivers for all programs. We were one of the first departments to conduct temperature checks and wellness screenings for both staff and visitors. And we had updates about COVID information on our website and sent out via our social me media messaging notices. The pandemic has been especially hard on our teens. So we continue to offer a free after-school TOPS team program at five locations. For participants needing ADA accommodations, we created and implemented an online request form, which allows our staff to quickly assess modifications that will be needed. We also implemented a new online donation system through our new recreation management system, RecTrack. And since our software went live on March the 9th, Financial assistance has received over $4,000 in online donations. Pullen Park, a family staple in our community, had to rethink safety at the park. They installed plexiglass dividers between seats on the Pullen train. Historic trolley tours reopened, offering a historic tour of downtown Raleigh three times a day every Saturday. The City of Raleigh Museum opened and featured an exhibit entitled Women of Change, the Legacy of the 19th Amendment. In April 2021, 
in honor of History Month, they led five walking tours of the community. The Pope House Museum increased their hours of operation uh, to 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Friday and Saturday, and 1 to 4 p.m. on Sunday. And Historic Mordecai has been open six days a week for tours teaching visitors about the property. In response to the community's needs, staff modified our active programs for all ages to be conducted outside to comply with COVID protocols and delivered indoor passive recreation programs for all age groups. One of our patrons emailed staff to let them know that our gentle floor yoga class at Five Points is her new passion. During the pandemic, we were determined that patrons would continue to receive excellent customer service. Therefore, we transitioned all board and commission meetings to a virtual format. We conducted virtual open houses and recorded them for viewing. We also deployed multiple online surveys and conducted virtual focus groups to get a pulse on our community and their needs. Our aquatic staff went above and beyond by modifying the American Red Cross lifeguarding curriculum to safely certify or recertify over 65 lifeguards. Spending countless hours, staff created 19 videos for training purposes. The pandemic wasn't the only crisis we faced. The death of George Floyd brought to our consciousness the inequalities occurring in our society. In response, the city created the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Several members of the Park Recreation and Cultural Resources Department serve on the citywide committee that is looking at diversity and inclusion efforts throughout our department and our community. Our department took a proactive approach by conducting Can We Talk sessions to facilitate conversations to normalize language around race equity. Seeing a need for safe outdoor events, More Square Market opened in May of 2021 and will run through October the 3rd. More Square itself has been open six days a week, featuring a gift shop with local items and exhibits, highlighting the square's integral role throughout Raleigh's history. A yearly holiday favorite for our 33 active adult clubs is our Golden Year celebration with WRAL. Due to social distancing guidelines, we were not able to hold the event in person. Determined not to disappoint our participants, our active adult program teamed up with WRAL to send 1,500 care packages that included a letter, a holiday card, an ornament, and a breakfast voucher uh, for the participants. For parents desperate for child care, we developed protocols so that children could still attend summer camps last year. Camps were offered from June through August over 2,000 summer campers attended camps at 23 of our sites. During that time, only two sites had to close for two weeks due to a possible infection. Summer camps this year opened on Monday of this week. And as I can say, uh, we were one of the few providers of summer camps uh, last summer. So um, it was such a, a tremendous uh, 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 reflection on the great work that staff does and, and on this slide, you can see a, a quote from a parent from last summer camp. Thank you, thank you, thank you for getting him into camp this summer. I have to work and I had no idea what I was going to do with him. Now that may either be a good thing or a bad thing, but we take it as a positive that he had a, an enjoyable summer despite the pandemic. For those of us working and involved in parks and recreation, it came as no surprise to find out that we are essential essential to the health and well-being of our community. We hosted 17 days of early voting for the presidential election at seven of our locations and day of voting for the presidential election. During early voting, over 1,035 voters participated in the electoral process through our facilities. On election day, we had 19 voting locations and over 6,000 voters passed through our doors. We also partnered with Wake County Health and Human Services to offer essential COVID testing and vaccination sites. Testing has occurred weekly at two to three locations since December the 14th, and Green Road Community Center has become vital in serving as a vaccination site. The pandemic uh, has hit our vulnerable communities even harder than others. 
we partnered with Wake County Public School System and the Interfaith Food Shuttle to provide 20,000 meals to summer camp and remote learning participants this past year. We also work with the Raleigh Police Department and other community stakeholders to host face covering and food giveaways. At three events, we served over 2,500 families and gave away over 10,000 face masks. The Meals on Wheels program at Five Points changed to a pickup location to provide individuals with a week's worth of frozen meals. Working with the Wake County Public School System, staff created remote learning day programs for students needing virtual schooling in grades K through eight. As the school system adjusted schedules, we quickly reopened our before and after school programs for students returning to in-person learning. Our youth program staff worked with Wake County teachers starting in August of 2020. They help with learning schedules and login issues for over 3,000 participants. We also provided lunches and weekend food through the Backpack Buddies program for these students. Our Greenway system saw a 300% increase in traffic during the pandemic. Due to this increase in use, we had to double trash service on some trails. We also implemented a wildflower program along sections of our trail and our outdoor recreation sites also saw significant increases in use during the pandemic. We didn't sit still at all during the pandemic. We mobilized. Through careful tracking of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act funding, we received $227,000 in reimbursement. We executed a partnership agreement with the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. As a result, this partnership will deliver 12 championships in Wake County over the spring of 2021. We also completely rethought business protocols in response to COVID-19. One of the big things that was accomplished uh, over the course of the year was taking on the Herculean task of transitioning to a new software system during the pandemic. Our software team met virtually four to five days a week, eight hours a day for an entire year. The result, a new system called RecTrack that is more automated and user-friendly for our participants. We also worked hard to bring arts and culture to the city. We partnered with the African American Cultural Festival, Art Explosure, and artists Napoleon Wright and Robin Bushnick for a digital interactive light art display at One Exchange Plaza that was held between September 4th through the 6th of 2020. Seen here, Sonark, it's an interactive light sculpture at the Duke Energy Center for Performing Arts, captures the imagination of visitors and residents alike. It was installed in 2020. As the virus lingered, we as a department had to become more innovative. With COVID guidelines in place, in November, we were able to resume non-fitness program for active adults. We hosted parking lot trivia events at Five Points. We also created a festive flicks drive-in movie series during the holidays at both Anderson Point and Spring Forest Road Parks. Committed to connecting and enriching our community through exceptional experiences, even when you need to play at home, our Play Anywhere virtual programming fill the gap in service delivery during the lockdown. Highlights of Play Anywhere were the call-in laugh line and the story time videos. We even created a Pinterest page for the ideas these virtual programs generated with the public. We also developed a new business model and vision for Peach Road Neighborhood Center. It will be our first cultural center in our community. And this summer, we will offer traditional summer camps but with an emphasis on different cultures. It will now be known as the Peach Road Cultural Center. We offered story walks at different locations. These programs were so popular that staff created new story walks for various sites, including Lake Johnson, and there's more uh, uh, works at other sites in progress. We quickly mobilized to develop a way to teach adult technology courses in person and virtually at the same time. Staff created programs on Alexa, Computer Basics, Google Apps, iPhone Basics, as well as Levels 1 and 2. For high school students that missed out on an in-person senior year, the Raleigh Youth Council led a virtual spirit week, culminating in a day of honor for Raleigh high school graduates. When the going got rough, R-U-F-F, -F, 
we got creative and opened up the Raleigh Municipal Building pop-up dog park in October through November of 2020. We reopened it again in January of 2021 and it is still being used. Every morning you will see residents of downtown sipping coffee or romping with their pups at the Raleigh Municipal Building. Raleigh Arts is working with several Raleigh organizations for projects on city property in the spring of 2021, as well as projects with the North Carolina Museum of Art. We teamed up with 25 artists that have created or are in the process of creating site-specific sidewalk murals in downtown Raleigh as part of Raleigh Arts Beats. The artwork seen here is titled Pure Love by Jermaine Powell, also known as JP, which is at the intersection of Davie and Wilmington Streets. We also partnered with JP and the Raleigh Department of Transportation to create a mural near the bike racks at Raleigh Union Station as part of May Bike Month festivities. For Bike Week, Go Raleigh staff asked our community centers to help them with a scavenger hunt. The popular event had participants taking selfies at our bike racks located at different community centers, parks, and greenway sections throughout Raleigh. For our active adult athletes, we are working with Wake County Senior Games to create a virtual program in 2021. More than 500 athletes participate in this event annually and our staff are heavily involved in planning it. We created and delivered activity kits for the Wake County Food Security Program. Staff delivered over 2000 kits in just two days. And we didn't let the pandemic ruin our holiday fun either. We hosted drive-through holiday events for Halloween, Christmas, and Easter. Mordecai hosted a virtual Halloween event and even had a costume contest. Over 15,000 masks were provided at the Halloween event. Little ones still got to speak to Santa through an extremely popular virtual phone call. Night of Lights and Festive Flicks holiday movies at Dix Park showcased the park. We offered everything from glow-in-the-dark Easter egg hunts, traditional egg hunts, to our first egg hunt for dogs to keep the fun rolling into the spring. Celebrations continue with Earth Day events in April, and we are looking forward to holding programs to recognize Juneteenth this month, uh, tomorrow, and this weekend. As we near the end of the journey through the pandemic, we don't know what the future may hold. One thing is for certain is that we are in this together, we are Raleigh Parks Recreation and Cultural Resources. We're actually just a bunch of fun-loving public servants who love our jobs and making a difference in the community. And we all had to find ways to stay sane during the course of the pandemic. And as you can see here, these are some screenshots from some of our various virtual meetings that we had. Um, and this kind of helped make us survive the, the, the year that we did have. To close, the Raleigh uh, Parks, Recreation and Cultural Resources team turned the words pandemic, pandemic into words of, and actions that best describe them. We persevere, we accomplish, they're nimble, they're determined, they're essential, they mobilize, they innovate, and they are creative. Thank you and thank you to our great PRCR team for getting us through this pandemic. Well done. Excellent report, Oscar. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you to all. all of you for the hard work. We we really encouraged Oscar to, to kind of do that, to pat the that they all should pat themselves on the back. There's been a lot of, of hard work going on in, in front of the scenes and behind the scenes. And it's nice to hear about all of it. So thank you very much. And, and there was together. probably a lot more that I, I could not cover because they did so much. And so I'm very proud of this team. Yeah, that's awesome. Great. Anyone have any comments or questions? Lovely. Great. Thumbs up. Great. Awesome. Um, next on the agenda is our work plan approval. This is an action item. I believe at the last meeting that I missed, you all talked through it and added some things and talked about some of the points that um, you know, maybe we wanted to massage. So hopefully you've had some time to, to read that work plan that is attached to the agenda. If you're online, you can open it up right now. Um, and if there's any comments right now, we can talk through it. Otherwise we can go ahead and, and move to approve. Any comments or questions, anyone? 
not seeing any. Okay, great. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve our work plan for next year? Move that we uh, accept our work plan for next year. Thanks, Kendall. So I hear a second. Uh, Christina <laughs> made a motion for second. That was cool. <laughs> Uh, all those in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any against? Hearing none, the motion passes to approve the work plan. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for all the, the thought and uh, work that went into that. We got a good one. Okay. Um, next, we have approval of meeting minutes. So these are from April. Any comments on the meet up, Marshall? I, yes, there is a, a mix up between Beverly and me, um, where she is making a committee report for the for my committee and I'm making the report for the Greenway committee. So okay. that, that did you see that, Beverly? <laughs> actually, I didn't. I just noticed that it was just April minutes and not May minutes. Oh, well, I, well, actually, this may have been the June minutes because I have it. I made a post it note. So it's the June minutes. I'm sorry. No, I'm, oh, I, I think, think there's April. only April that's posted. Okay. April. Well, oh, I, okay. This is April. Yeah. That, well, good catch. <laughs> nice, thorough reading. Well yeah. done. <laughs> Any other comments or corrections? Well the, well, the only issue is that our agenda says April and May minutes, and the May minutes weren't there. I made that change. It says April. It almost oh. says April. OK, sorry. I looked at an yeah. older version. Great. Well, hearing no other comments, would anyone like to make a motion to approve? So moved. Great, thanks, Charlie. And Beverly, were you jumping on there for a second? <laughs> awesome. Okay, so seconded by Beverly. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any, any against? Hearing none, the motion passes to approve the minutes. Great. Um, next, we have the director's report. Oscar, do you have still more to tell us? Yes. Um... Not, not as lengthy, but, but very important information. Uh, first of all, I did want to go ahead and say that uh, uh, thank you for everyone's support. Uh, this past Saturday, June the 12th, we had the ribbon cutting and dedication for the, uh, for the new John Chase Memorial Park. It was very well attended, a lar very large crowd, a uh, full day of activities, I think going all the way up to like 11 p.m. with, with, with movies. Um, but it was, it was very, uh, you know, emotional to see a lot of people out there. The, the community was very supportive of this park. It was a long time coming. Uh, we even had descendants of, uh, of uh, John Chavis uh, uh, there at the facility uh, and, uh, for the, for the uh, dedication. But uh, it's just a, a preview of things to come. Um, and it was just like I had mentioned, it was very well attended and just great job to everybody who was involved. Staff did a really great job. Uh, pulling the uh, day's events together. And uh, for the most part, um, the community approves of what they see. And so um, I do know that uh, during the course of the, uh, of the ceremony, it had been uh, stated uh, several times uh, uh, by our elected officials that they do support uh, the next phase of, of John Chavis phase two in the upcoming bond program to keep, keep the momentum going. So uh, I do wanna thank staff uh, for all their hard work as well as the community for all the countless hours they put in for advocating for the project and working with staff to make this happen. So um, it, it was a day of celebration for all of us. So thank you all for your support. A um, Couple of other things coming up. Uh, uh, tomorrow is uh, Juneteenth. It's the, uh, the, the first time that the, that the city of Raleigh uh, recognized it as a city holiday. Um, and so uh, with that, there are some events that are going to be scheduled uh, this coming weekend to recognize uh, Juneteenth. And uh, for more information, you can go ahead and find it on our website. But I did wanna point out that 
There will be a Capital City Juneteenth celebration at Dix Park on Saturday. Uh, our Pope House Museum will be having programming uh, actually starting uh, uh, Friday uh, through Sunday, June 18th through the 20th uh, at the Pope House. And then there will also be a small uh, program at Chavis Park on Saturday as well. So we'll, be make, uh, we'll make sure we follow up and send you a link to some of these events in case you are interested in celebrating Juneteenth over the weekend. Uh, the week of June 21st to 27th is um, uh, we're going to be celebrating Pollinator Week. And so if you all recall, in March of 2021, Mayor Baldwin signed the National Wildlife Federation's Mayor's Monarch Pledge. And so um, what our great parks team is going to be doing is they're going to be promoting our pollinator gardens via our social media channel starting June 21st to 27th. And they will basically have some live streams going on from some of our pollinator sites. They're also gonna be hosting a plant giveaway at the Moore Square Market on June 27th from 11 to three. And they will be giving away uh, pollinator friendly plants to encourage things like monarchs, Bees and hummingbirds are things that are very vital to the poll pollination of, of, uh, of plants. And so uh, with that being said, uh, our team is committed to increasing the number of monarch way stations and pollinator guards within our park system. So there is a lot more to come with that. Um, our summer camps began this past Monday, uh, uh, June the 14th, and things have gone very well as we close the first week of camp. Uh, in addition, our seasonal pools open over Memorial Day weekend, and we've been having pretty high visitation numbers. Um, it's not all, you know, um, fireworks and, and, and celebrations. We are still having to struggle with, with hiring a part-time seasonal staff, just like it is across all various industries. So we are being very cognizant that we may have to slightly reduce uh, capacity, uh, operating hours and so forth, just to make sure that we can um, continue to serve the community as best that we can. Um, but we're, our staff have been trying to do, be very creative as much as possible on making sure that, uh, that we try to provide that service as much as we can with our, with our, our reduced staffing, staffing levels. Um, and as far as upcoming events, uh, you all should be receiving in the next couple of days uh, invitation for our Panthers Play 60 Challenge Course uh, dedication at Barwell Road Park. That is going to be on July the 13th at 9.30 a.m. And this was a partnership between Parks and Recreation and the Carolina Panthers to create a NFL Carolina Panthers theme challenge course and playground at Barwell Road Park. So it's gonna be a very uh, great event. There may be some Panthers players there that day, uh, in addition to some other special guests. So we look forward to seeing you all uh, July 13th out at Barwell Road Park. And that is all I have for today. And I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Oscar. So is that uh, the Panthers play, is that an example of a naming right that was because they gave money for that, that play element? Naming right slash donation. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. because it did not come through the parks board, I don't believe, that went straight to council, right? That's an example of that. Yeah, that they actually have not asked for naming. It'll be called Barwell Road Playground, but on the sign, we'll mm -hmm. have NFL Play 60. Thank you mm -hmm. to the Panthers. Um, okay. So it's not an, an official naming right, yeah. but yeah, it's a good example of how we'll recognize the donor. Yep. Um, yep. They gave us $150,000 to do it. So. Well, I think that's great. That's been a long time coming, so. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. It's over. the only one that around, there's one in Charlotte but there's not one beyond besides Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And Lindsay's over there putting all kinds of helpful things in the chat if anyone wants to click on any of that. <laughs> She's quick. Great, thank you for that report. Does anyone have any um, questions or comments for Oscar? I do, Lindsay does. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, 
so uh, we we kind of touched on it right before, um, well, earlier, um, but I was wondering if you can uh, provide a little more detail on um, when Chavis Carousel will reopen, what I read said August. Um, and then the other question was, was the Chavis dedication supposed to be live streamed? Because I had a friend who tried to tune in and she couldn't find the live stream. Uh, let me answer the uh, the live stream first. Uh, I believe the uh, the dedication ceremony was to be live streamed via RTN. Um, so I am not sure if she was trying to go through another uh, you know YouTube or what, but it was supposed to be streamed to RTN, and we did have the uh, the camera crew there. Um, and the RTN really goes to the YouTube, right? I believe so. Typically, whenever like I would access RTN, I would just hit that that link that's on the city's uh, web page. You know, it'll have like the screen, and then with the play button, and that will usually get you get you over there. Uh, I have not heard anything about other people possibly having issues seeing it, but we can look into seeing if uh, there is a video, a recorded video of it, and possibly we can make that available if there if if that if that is available to us. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Okay, we'll take a look into that, and then I'll uh, I'll let Scott uh, address the, uh, the the carousel situation. Yes, as of this morning, at about uh, or right before noon, we were mm -hmm. informed that it was going to take four to six weeks to get the new motor in for the carousel. Oh no! Uh, so that was ordered because it's not in stock, and the supply chains are are a little still delayed. Yeah. From COVID. But then uh, there was a team that was still working on it. We had it working. So right now we're, we're still ordering the motor and anticipating coming in. But if we can keep it uh, running partially, we will. But we, you know, when you're dealing with a historic asset, we have to be really careful with it. You have to be careful. Yeah. yeah. So um, we do know that we've ordered the motor and anticipate four to six weeks. It's probably why we posted that date out there to, to be aware that it may be closed for that length of time err on the side of caution. Got it. Okay, thanks so much. Questions, Beverly? Did you have something? Yes, and this is sort of to Oscar, and I'm all, it's also directed to you and the rest of the board as to when there's an appropriate time in our meeting to discuss this. The bond issue, mm -hmm. um, I receive, you know, I know we're no longer setting priorities for that, and council's handling that but I received a email from a city councilor and regardless of what I think or any of us think about the delay of the elections to November 22, um, this email said that that was the time frame for putting the bond issue. And there is precedent in this community for bond issues not being at the same time as elections. And so it's a question to ask or it's a question to when we want to talk about this, but I think that we need to discuss this and I would be very in favor of the bond issue being far sooner than November because it takes three or four months for bonds to be issued. So we're talking about a bond issue that we discussed in 2019 and um, 2020, not actually beginning to pull the shovel on until 2023 and that's outrageous given the needs that this community has and the growth that we're experiencing so it's kind of oscar it's kind of the whole board and it's a hot potato maybe but i think we need to take a stand on um, on that issue yeah, that yeah. to. i would I, I would need to kind of go back and see exactly you know what options are available if if any, I just don't know if it's tied in due to the um, to the census data. Um, but no, bond issues are not tied to the census data. I know, but how? But, but like with the elections and so forth. So um, I know that was a a. Uh, There's a primary to be held in yes in March, and there mm -hmm. is precedent for bond issues being held at the time of primaries. Okay. So it has happened in Wake County in the past. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point, Beverly. I mean, when we first were working on the bond, we were told there was a 
there, most recently that there was a chance it could be extended based upon the census taking a while and all that. But for it to continue to be pushed out all the way to November is is much longer than I, th I feel like we were originally being told that it could yeah, potentially and, be and in I the think, spring. I think our role needs to be to communicate to council the need to separate um, the bond from the elections and that, um, you know, whatever they're doing with elections, we don't get to decide that. But we we have we do have a role in advocating for a sooner bond issue because the needs are so great and the growth is just crazy. Well, and what I've always heard is that it can't be its own separate thing. But if there is another election going on, like the primary, yeah. then that that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Beverly. I think that's uh, your points are well taken, and um, the, there are great needs. And to wait longer to 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 address them doesn't serve any well anyone well. I don't think. It, as soon as we can, the money that we're getting from that new tax, if you could let us know how that'll be spent and how that affects sort of our prioritization. It might just be money that's already spent, you know, three years ago because of the nature of the accounting. But we just passed; they just passed the budget um, with that tax increase. So yeah, and and this might be a good time. I was going to mention it later, but we can go ahead and mention it now. That that um, the penny tax, as you know, was was approved, but the additional staff hiring to go along with that was not. So, you know, something, and I'm sure that Stephen or Oscar can speak more to that, but my understanding is that there was a request from the parks um, department to have additional staff to help with those maintenance dollars that will be coming with the penny tax, and that portion was not approved. So that is something that, you know, again, we are the advocates for the parks department. So if there is, you know, if that's something that, that folks feel strongly about, that's something to reach out to your council folks. Um, did I say that right, Oscar, as far as like the staff and the dollars? <laughs> I, I, I'm not, not that you have said those words, but I'm, I'm just no, yes, sure we, I got the we, facts we, right. Yeah, we had worked with the budget office on identifying uh, the, the number of, of staff that would be needed, um, you know, if, if, a, if a one penny or even a two penny uh, tax were put in place just to be able to kind of keep up with the uh, amount of work that would have to be done and what that budgetary impact would be. Uh, unfortunately, we did not get the staffing. Uh, we are looking at some possible alternatives or, or solutions that we can do in the interim to at least get us through, uh, through this next fiscal year. Um, and so we will be continuing to try to work um, in case we do have the opportunity to request the staff for the following fiscal year. Um, but uh, I think uh, Stephen and his team are putting together a, uh, a, a plan of action for the, um, the funds for this upcoming year um, that, uh, that would be a, a reasonable plan that we would be able to do with, with our current staffing resources. Uh, Marcia, you've had your hand up. Yes, is it appropriate for our board to send a memo to council uh, recommending or uh, that the parks bond be voted on um, or be put on the bond for folks for um, the, I'm sorry, not the bond, the bond to be put on the pri uh, primary election. Is it, you know, can we send them a memo from the, um, the board if we're all in agreement this needs to be considered? I mean, how, how does that communication occur, I guess, is another way to ask the question. That if, if, it, if it's a will of the board that, you know, they want to make that proposal to council, uh, that would be something that uh, Jennifer as being the chair would champion and would get over to the council. Uh, and it would just be basically, you know, the, the board feels this way, we want to make this recommendation and they will vet it and see what happens. 
And I would, I would be happy to do that, but I would want to be sure that we have a majority of the board that feels that way before writing such a memo. So I would request that everyone uh, right now, you know, kind of uh, let me know with a show of hands if you're in favor of such a, uh, a motion and then we can, I can draft something up. Great. I'm seeing everybody. There's Lex. Okay. Carol, Miss Ashcraft, you, okay, great. All right. So I think I'm seeing everybody except. Jennifer, okay. let me, um, as you do, I think I, Stephen raised his hand and I want to make sure he is, is not going to correct me if I'm wrong uh, on some. Now, I, 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 before you issue the letter, um, I think it's good for us for now to check with our, uh, our mm -hmm. general counsel, our attorney's office. I think there has to be a municipal election in order to be on the ballot, not just a primary. I don't want you to issue a letter that actually is counter to the general statute requirements. Sure. Um, so it's just more, if, 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 and, and you've all voted on it, so if that's being the case, but let us confirm that um, before you issue that letter. That, that's, that's all I wanted to recommend. I would appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Yep. yep. Hey, this is Christina. I have to have my hand up. So um, I just had a few things. One, in regards to this, don't we have a liaison to council that we could speak to um, if we are not to, to help clarify these issues? Um, just wondering if we could get we do. liaison we do. so we can clarify yeah. any questions prior. To sure. Yeah, actually, um, I, I can reach out to him tomorrow and see. Right. You know, I mean, I don't know if that's the answer. I just thought, you know, what I feel like that's the purpose of a liaison. So I'm just wondering. But the second thing, um, Oscar, going back to, uh, I know that you mentioned in your, in one of the reports that you gave that you're understaffed in um, summertime and, and, and all that available. And I wanted to say that after the last meeting, I told my nephew about it and now he's going to be driving the train at Poland Park. So I'm really excited <laughs> about that. And I'm just wondering how else can we assist? Is there like a job thing that I can push out that I can help you with to find some staff? I, I, I don't want you to be understaffed. Yeah, um, we do have all of our uh, positions listed on our, on our website or at least on the city of Raleigh employment site. What we can do is maybe share that link with you all and maybe share some other social media uh, posts that we have been trying to, to uh, encourage uh, uh, hires. One, one thing that we've had to do to pivot this summer is we're hiring younger people than, we, than we're used to hiring because they're a little bit more open to entry level jobs. And so I think that has kind of been our saving grace this year is um, the ability to hire younger than normal. Um, it, it is putting them, giving them some more responsibility at an earlier age but uh, they're really gonna help us hobble through this summer. And this is not, like I had mentioned earlier, this is not just a Raleigh PRCR problem. It's across all industries, uh, other departments. Um, and so we're just trying to find ways how we can be a little bit more creative on, on attracting that talent that's out there. Right, if there's any way I can help, I just wanna get you guys staff. So I'd love Thank to help you. you. And, and in the chat, Scott has shared the uh, link to our uh, career page that has all the positions listed. And it, it's in the weekly newsletter as well. I remember seeing it in there because mm -hmm. I was scanning it to see if my daughter was old enough and she's not. <laughs> Good questions, Christina. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, moving on then, that was great conversation. Um, We'll just go quickly through our standing committees. Um, parks, we need a chair. And I believe I heard that Christina has volunteered. Yeah. yeah. I definitely, I know I'm not on the parks committee. I'm on two different committees. So I don't want to overstep by any means, but I know you've asked a few times and I'd be really, really interested in helping out in any way I can. Sounds good. With the, the new work plan that we just passed, we'll have some items on there for the Parks Committee to be working on. So it's great to have somebody um, on board for that. So thank you. Uh, Fletcher Committee, Charlie, I don't think you have anything. You've done your hard work. Nope, no report. Uh, officially handing over the reins to Lindsay for this next year though. 
sweet. Awesome. Great. Uh, Greenways Committee, Beverly, I, I think we just went through a bulk of what you've been working on. That's right. And we did not meet in June, so we will meet again in July. Very good. Uh, Marcia, Sustainability, Wildlife, and Urban Trees Committee. We meet Monday. Okay. And that's <laughs> four, yes. It, well, we welcome. If you're interested in what the, these things to do with nature, we'd love to have you join us. It's a great committee. Um, very good. Devereaux Meadows Park. Anyone who's a liaison to that have any report? Brad, Christina, and Charlie. I don't have a full report. I do want to say I'm so excited about the level of outreach that they're doing. I know a few different organizations that have reached out to them and they don't hesitate for a second to go and meet with them. So I'm really, really, um, I'm happy with, with how responsive they are. Wonderful. Committee liaison reports, Arts Commission. Uh, Hello, good evening. Um, arts is cooking. They are really cooking. Um, they got, I don't re remember how much money it was, but they got a big grant. I think it was in the line of 200,000 plus from the Shattered vid use grant a federal program and they're going to be use, using that one to staff up so and they also have a um project going on wings of the city nine bronze statues all on the theme of different artists all on the theme of quote the desire of the body to fly end quote. I love that. Um, as uh, my father was a B-17 bomber pilot, he passed on to me the love of flight. I'm definitely going to look at these sculptures. Um, then in conjunction with uh, Pollinator Week, or, or not, they've got public art for pollinators and people. And They've got a fourth generation woman beekeeper who's going to be, um, it's getting dark in here now, um, enriching the community through art. So, and then and in conjunction with that, definitely is BEE -E downtown. And um, they're going to have events at Governor's Mansion and Dick's and other places. Um, at their meeting, which was Monday, I mentioned how the bond would affect their great concern that the Sertoma Arts Center be renovated. Um, they also talked about invasives, which I thought was an interesting overlap. Um, about what? What did you say? The invasives. Oh, invasive species. Invasive species. parks. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yes. Uh, both animal, both, you know, vegetable and animal. So, um, and then there's a, oh, the Medal of Arts program was recorded this year. It's pretty darn spectacular. I will find the link for you and distribute it via Javona. And, um, I think, as I recall, the presenter wore a tuxedo. Anyway, it's really great. So, and I think that's it. Oh, yes, they, they got a, one more thing, they've got an artist's call. And this is for anybody, any one of you on the commission, on the staff could do this if you wanted. And y'all probably heard of this before. I have a vague memory of it. But n now you're going to be able to go to a newspaper kiosk and put in your quarter or whatever, or not, I don't know if it's free, and pull out art. And therefore, anybody in here, I used to be good at print media. 
So <laughs> I want to drag out all one of my old prints, make some more copies. I could sell it for a quarter of print in one of the kiosks. Um, and so the, you don't have to put in a whole lot. I think 20, for some reason, 25 rings a bell and I don't think it's since. I think that's the number of copies that you can, but of course, if you're gonna make 25 copies, you need only one to respond to the call for artists. So any prospective or former artists currently practicing artists out there, y'all, it's time to go find that out. I should send that out too, just for fun. And that completes the Arts Commission Liaison Report. Thank you, Carol. And Scott just sent a link to the Medal of Arts Awards, if anyone wants to take a look at that, and the YouTube link. And my son just brought me dinner, so that was great. Um, <laughs> <Jen. laughs> right. So let's wrap this up. Uh, it looks good. Um, okay, next, BPAC, Christine. We, we meet on Monday. I feel so bad. I did not have a report last month and now the meeting is not till next week. I promise next month I will have a report. I promise. No worries. No worries. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, I believe, is Historic Cemeteries Commission. Do we have any report for that? Uh, there's no, no report for uh, the cemetery. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dick's Leadership Committee. Um, trying, I, I don't know that I took good notes at the last meeting I attended. We have another meeting coming up for that next week. So Tuesday. I'll have, what's that? Tuesday yeah. morning. Tuesday. So I'll have more to report at that time. The biggest thing, I believe the last meeting was that the chapel is officially <laughs> open. Yes. And y'all got that, that invitation to that opening, um, a little last minute, but we, we got invited. So, um, that was a really great turnout. I saw a couple of y'all there and um, it's a very beautiful place if you haven't been yet. And the best part is that there are restrooms now <laughs> in the park, public restrooms. Um, Stephen and Oscar, did you wanna add anything for Dick's uh, Leadership Committee? The, the next community meeting, it'll be in person at the chapel will be July 13th. Great, thank you. And then the Historic Resources and Museum Advisory Board. Um, I have a few notes from that. Um, a lot of what I was gonna say has already been touched on. Um, the uh, HRMAB did vote on the um, Chavis Memorial Interpretive Plan revisions. And so they had been reviewing that and approved that. And I thought that was interesting that they got their input into that. Um, the recordings of their meetings will now be on RTM's YouTube page. So you too can um, watch those meetings if you'd like to later. Um, and then uh, city council did formally approve the recommendation from the um, historic uh, cemeteries and the historic uh, resources museum advisory board to remain separate entities. That had been a discussion point and uh, they had decided to stay separate and city council accepted that. Those are my notes. Uh, chair report. I don't have anything additional at this time. We touched on it earlier with the um, lack of staff just to, to go along with the, the penny tax. So that's something that um, I hope we can, we can talk more about and, and think about as um, advocates for the park system. Does anyone else have any general topics that they'd like to discuss or comments, Brad? Really briefly, this isn't one of my normal long ones. I, I was walking today and I saw um, next to Pope House, there was a trailer that said, we're going electric in maintenance. And I don't know that that's, has that been announced and I missed it? I've heard it discussed, yes. And I think that they've been doing it more and more, rolling it out, Oscar, yeah. Yeah, that, that is our, our, uh, our inaugural trailer uh, that, that basically kind of has, uh, hauls around some of our um, battery powered maintenance equipment, such as uh, weed eaters, blowers, hedge trimmers, you know, et cetera. So it's just kind of a, a, an environmental sustainability effort that we're trying to do. And this is part of our branding. I'm not sure if we did, um, uh, 
let this group know specifically that we're doing that, but we did put out some items uh, via social media, uh, kind of letting the public know about this endeavor. But uh, if you all like at some point in time, maybe we can kind of, you know, do a uh, just a very brief presentation and upcoming meeting about how that process works and, and what the next steps are. That's awesome. And that's been presented, I believe, to the Sustainability um, Committee. Yeah, Marcia, yes. were you about to speak on that? So maybe that's where I've heard it, mm -hmm. yeah. So you may see that trailer around, it just basically says we're plugged in. Yeah, it's super sexy. Yeah. And I have to say that at your the sustainability committee's meeting, they did discuss the, their careful use of pesticides, very little and careful use. And I saw that in you, I saw that happening real time the other day when I was out for a jog and I had to stop in my tracks and turn around because there were signs up everywhere blocking the path saying. We are currently spraying. Do not go this way. <laughs> so it's true. Any other um, comments, questions, general? Yeah, I just thoughts? had one more thing. I read an article today, and I thought of everyone um, in the News and Observer that our it, and I I might be getting it wrong that there's a three thousand mile like system green that it's going to now connect to our greenway system too so we're going to be part of this 3,000 mile trail from florida to maine is, is that, the east that, that greenway right? yeah that's what it's yeah called. i didn't realize that. they basically put their label on our greenway <laughs> so what you read christina there's only two state trails um it's the um mountains to the sea trail the state is now going to say um, that the East Coast Greenway that comes through the Triangle will be an official state trail, which is good for us, means we can have more access to money. Um, it's still the Raleigh's trail, but the state will say it'll be a part of their official trail system. It's more emblematic or um, kind of symbolic, but it, it is good because we can now access um, more opportunities for dollars. But we built it, we paid for it, we maintain it. Um, and, and we'll take credit that it is a Raleigh trail. Of course, I was okay. just it's, saying it's congratulations. Cool. I thought that was really yeah. cool and I wanted to say- It's a good that. thing. It's a good thing, but Beverly's right. Yeah. No. <laughs> Maybe more tourists coming through on the trail. One small thing again, sorry, terrible. I, I walked over to Chavis before this to, to get myself bumped up to have a long meeting. And um, there's still 50 to 100 people there hanging out. And both Javis and um, uh, More Square this summer have just been so alive with people. Um, so if you if you go off off times, I would encourage you to go. I mean, I walk through More Square at seven in the morning and eleven o'clock at night. There's always people in there, um, and it's just fun to be part of that sort of experience. And the grounds crew is doing a heck of a job in More Square because that thing is beat up. <laughs> and apparently, there was a break in of one of the facilities at Moore Square. It's all right. It's before, right. It was before budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, one of our storage um, rooms next to the uh, Salvation Army building where we kept some of our uh, audio video equipment was uh, broken into and so we've sustained some damage to equipment. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. Anything else, anyone? I forgot to mention that as of yesterday, there are still a few tickets left for Sweet Honey and the Rock at the Museum of Art tomorrow night. Oh, as wow. Part of June, as part of June 19th. Juneteenth, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Well, we've completed our agenda and uh, we've gotten through everything. So, at this point, we can go ahead and adjourn if everyone's good with that. Thank you. Have a great night. Bye-bye.